before everything happened. I met Dennis and my five kids at King Gyro in Madison. We all sat down to have dinner thinking everything was okay. He started lashing out at me in public and it just humiliated me. So I said, you know what? I can't do this. You no, know, you just make sure the kids are all right. I gotta go. I even probably get two bites of my food. Not knowing that that was gonna be the last, the last meal with all five of my children. Real life stories to bring awareness to domestic violence, human trafficking, and systemic corruption. Welcome to our podcast and lives. We are so happy that you joined us and hope that you like and follow us and would love for you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Let the show begin. And the picture that's behind me, that's the, that's the two kids that got so precious that is a cute picture I mean, is that one that you sent to me i think so yeah it's i put it that. in there because i i want it there you know so people can see see the kids yeah absolutely absolutely it's terrifying it is and there are so many perpetrators out there that just get away with you know things that they do and there are so many circumstances and situations similar to this where you know people go to the authorities for help and they get ignored and then tragic situations like this occur you know and at a young and at a young age i was sold for you know we'll get we'll get there it, it was sad but yeah. i'm i'm a survivor so amen amen one day at a time we all heal and move forward and do the best we can with what we're given and Try to do what we can to shed some light on the evil, and, and that's all we can do. Right. And if you can't take it one day at a time, take it one minute at a time. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So where do you yeah. want to start? Well, it really, it all started when I was young. Some of my mom's friends had done me wrong, would pick me up, tell me for And the older I got, I thought it was okay, because that's what taught and that's what I was shown as a child. So when I got 13, 14 years old, I was like, I rebelled on my mom. I didn't believe that my, I didn't think that my mom would believe me because it was her, her people that she knew. So when I turned 14, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm getting out of the house. I was at my grandpa's house one day when I was 14 and I had walked up to the lenders in Beach Grove to meet some friends to go deliver some some dishes because that's what they were doing at the time. Well, I was waiting on them and then this man pulled up in a van and he said, Hey, do you want to smoke? A I know your mom. And I said, sure. So I got in the van, we smoked and he said, Hey, would you, could you clean my house? Because my parents are sick and they can't do it. And I said, well, okay, I will ask my mom and see if she's okay with it. And he stated, well, I know your mom, so she will be okay with it. So we got done. I went home and I said, hey, mom, I met this person. He wants me to clean his house because his parents can't do it. My mom said, that is fine. So I had went over there to clean Dennis's house. One thing led to another. He was 29. I was 14. He said, show me your. So I did because I thought it so when i did we ended up having i got pregnant i was 14 i went to school oh it was in september because august 10th and 91 i found out i was two months pregnant so in september i went to school in eighth grade i was leaving school getting my stuff out of the locker beach road police department come behind me two of them and they said where are you going I said, I'm going home. They said, no, you're not. So they take me to a guardian's home for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. I call my mom, beg my mom to come and get me. She said, I can't do nothing until Monday. <clears throat> okay. So my mom comes and gets me Monday. And I'm wanting to say September the 16th, 17th, somewhere around there. So mom comes and gets me. We go to Dennis's house in Beach Grove, 1899 Alton Street. So we get there and they have already made arrangements for me and Dennis to go down to Salina, Tennessee and get married. I'm 14, this man 29 years old. Okay, so wow. on September the 20th, we go down to Salina, Tennessee and get married. 
my mom signed the paper for me to get married. And after the fact, I found out that my mom was going to be charged with neglect of a dependent and he was going to be charged for statutory. So that's why they signed, my mom signed the paper. I was pregnant. Everything was going good. He treated me good. I wanted to get pregnant at 14 because I wanted somebody to love me and somebody to love for the rest of my life. And that's why I wanted to have a baby at 14. And I know that that was, I know that now I know that wasn't right because I should have grown up. I was just a baby myself. April 15th, I had Josephine. She was the light of my world. She was my heart, my apple. Everything was good. We'd go camping. He treated me good. He treated Josephine good. And then I got pregnant again with my second child. I had my second child at 17, which is Michael. His name is Dennis Michael, but he does not like to be called Dennis because of what his dad done. When I had Michael, he started getting verbally abusive, verbally. And then 17, I had Michael. And then 19, I had Brandon. Okay. Brandon is not Dennis's child. Dennis would make me have with anybody that would come in that house if he wanted me to have sex with him. And if I did not have sex, he would beat on me and he would make me have sex with him. He even went as far as turning me on to his nephew, Robbie, and he's no longer here. He passed in 93. I'm not sure what year he passed away. I can't remember right off the top of my hand. We started having a, like symptoms with him and I fell in love with Robbie. His, and it, this is his nephew. And when he turned me on to Robbie, I fell in love with Robbie. Me and Robbie had a connection, but Robbie couldn't go any further with his family. And he didn't feel like he, would, he felt like he would be trapped. And it wouldn't be right that we sailed away with each other. And then I was pregnant with Brandon. And in 96, I had Brandon. Robbie knew that Brandon was his. Dennis knew that Brandon was his. Really started getting hitting on me, beating on me, doing more drugs, doing more. He had even held a gun to me in the shower one time. I could have left then, but I didn't want to leave because of my kids. I felt like my kids needed that, but I didn't need to be abused. So, well, you were still so young, too. You can't hold yourself responsible for that. That was not your responsibility. And I think it's really, really important that you're aware of that. Don't blame yourself for their failure to keep you safe and protect you. That was their job. When you're that young, your brain is literally incapable of processing things like that in a healthy and proper manner to be able to make a healthy and good decision. Well, he had even, when I had met him, his friends, when I met Dennis, his friends even made the comment, is that your daughter? with her mom because my mom had, had with him before my mom and my uncle knew him he was a dealer in beach grove by the age of 23 i had five children and then i i was tired of it i i couldn't take the abuse no more he was beating on me he was showing my kids that you know this is how you treat a woman and that's not how you treat a woman if your wife is laying out in the yard sun tanning and a man comes up to talk to you, you tell him, hey, look, there's my wife. You can have sex with her if she wants. And the man says, no, I don't want to do that. And I say, I have to do it because if I don't do it, he's going to beat on me. So I had to do it. So by the age of 23, I had three children. And then at the age of 23, I lost two children. One night I had a friend over and he was at work and we were talking by the fireplace. And then he had come home early and I thought that he was going to be at work, you know, until six o'clock in the morning. Well, he come home early and me and my friend, which the friend was my first that I had with when I was probably 13, but he wasn't really my first because I had been sold for money to older men. So the first him, of your choice that wasn't yeah, the first of my you? choice. Yeah. When I was 13, that was the first of my choice. One night, Dennis had come home. I was pregnant with Jacob, my last baby. He come home from the bar and I was sitting on the bed and I had asked him, I said, where you been? And he just open handed slapped me and knocked me down back in the bed. And this is not the first time that he hit me. He had literally sh hit me so hard. He knocked me backwards 
over the rocking chair and i was pregnant at that time too i can't remember which child it was that night when he come in and he hit me i said i had enough i had enough of the abuse you're not gonna hit me no more so i took my left hand and i balled it up and i i just swung at him well when i swung at him it busted his earlobe open literally from the top to the bottom good so, head and me <laughs> i think if i would have done that the first time maybe he would have stopped maybe he would have me he told me that he was the devil's right hand man for years i was with this man for eight years and then i finally wanted to get away from him the last time he went to jail he was on probation he hit me i would call the police have him locked up then he would make me feel guilty and say you know what about the kids what about the kids so i would drop i would drop everything so they would drop it then it would happen again i would drop it it would happen again well i got tired of dropping it the last time i didn't drop it so the last time that everything went chaotic he took an axe to my house in front of the children my mother had called me and said you need to come and get the kids because he has done went crazy and tore the house up with an axe so i went and got my children and yeah at the time i was done with him and i was talking to jesse and that was the first of my choice when i had when i was 13. he went to jail for that and for violation of probation i think he was in jail for like 45 days so my thinking i said why he's in jail i can get away i can pack my stuff up i can pack my kids and i can leave and he won't stop me so that's what i did i packed everything i didn't leave anything in that home but that was his home when he grew up <laughs> So I, I literally took everything, everything of his, everything of his parents, everything. I only left a box, a dish pack because I had packed furniture for many, many years. He wouldn't hold a job. I relied on food stamps to feed my family. There wasn't heat in the house half the time. I had to use a wood burning stove. There was only two bedrooms for you know the five kids by the time I turned 23. When I left, I had moved to Fountain Square into a home that I lived in when I was younger, the home where I was being sold for the money when i was a child i moved back into that home oh that had to have been so triggering thinking that he wouldn't find me and i was dating this man jesse well when i moved i look i myself i packed everything up i loaded everything up and i put it in the in the new house and i'm thinking okay i'm safe now nothing's gonna happen well dennis was calling me trying to call me trying to talk to my kids and i i wouldn't talk to him for the whole 45 days i was done i, I was completely done i i washed my hands of him and i always told him i will never keep our children forever because i did not have my dad when i was growing up and my my real biological dad is a preacher he's got seven other children and he does not have anything to do with me he come out to me and we deer hunted a couple times and after we found out that he was 99 percent my father but after that he doesn't talk to me and that breaks my heart too but you know what i'm 47 at the time i lived 42 years without him i don't need him my stepdad Dwayne, is my dad he was there for me when all my children were born he was there for me when my two children got and i was there for him when he died i took care of him until his last breath i ignored dennis would write me letters i have all the letters still and finally i opened them when he was dead 45 days went by and i didn't talk to him nothing like that so he found me they released him i wrote the judge and i told the judge look i'm in fear for my life and my kids life my family dennis even told the jail that when he got out he was going to his family he wrote his best friend a letter telling her that things were not going to be good when he got out I never seen that letter. Do they check mail and such, or is that not something that they do in the jail? They are supposed to, they are supposed to. He didn't want another daughter because he said Josephine was special. Well, when I had my daughter, Jennifer, he didn't even want to hold her because she was a girl. He didn't want my mom in the delivery room with any of my kids. Well, my mom was in the delivery room with my last two kids, Jennifer and Jacob. And he was so angry about that, that he didn't hold his children. I have five children, three children are only his two of the other children are not. And he knew this. He even wrote in the letters that I know Robbie's Brandon's dad and I know when he died that broke your heart and your heart went with him. And it did because Robbie would sit on the porch with me and talk to me till sun up. And I know this sounds bad, but Dennis done me so wrong. I would get Xanaxes in his drink to make him pass out just so I could be, so I could be me. A little bit of time where you didn't have to be afraid. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I was afraid. I was afraid, but I wasn't because I thought that he would never do me like that, but he did. So when I, when I finally left, when he was in jail, he found me and he knocked on the door and I opened the door and my heart just sank and he come in and my boyfriend at the time had le just left for work. And I was like, no. So he come back around because he forgot something at the house. 
And I told him, I said, don't leave me. He said, I got to go to work, Jennifer. So he went to work and I said, okay, I'll be fine. And Dennis said, I want the kids. I want to see the kids. I want to take them home with me. Well, he had already been to the house, to his house. He had already seen that everything was gone, but a box, a couple boxes that, that I did not take. And so I didn't want him, I really didn't want him to take the kids because I didn't know what was going to happen. And my son, Michael, he told me not too long ago that he didn't really want, he didn't want to go, but Dennis made him go. And so he took all five of the kids he had them for a week he tried to tell me that he had aids that a couple of my kids would have it just to scare me that was false information and then one day on december the 7th i had woke up and i told jesse i said i don't feel right well before that the wednesday before everything happened i had went to king gyros on madison i met dennis and my five kids at king gyro on madison we all sat down to have dinner well i went up to get my kids food his food my food thinking everything was okay he started lashing out at me in public and it just humiliated me so i said you know what i can't do this i i gotta go you know you just make sure the kids are all all right i gotta go so i called jesse and he come and pick me up i didn't even get even probably get two bites of my food not knowing that that was gonna be the last the last meal with all five of my children so he kind of got me and he did us put the kids in the car and i kind of followed him when he went his way to beach grove i went my way to fountain square to my house and i told him i said make sure the kids go to school because josephine she was so smart michael he was so smart but he was abusive to michael he would hit michael so hard my son michael when he takes his glasses off now his eye turns in and he has to wear glasses full time he can't have surgery to fix it and my mom would always get on him don't hit michael in the head because it can damage him and it did so on december 7th i'd woke up probably about 5 36 o'clock and i told jesse i said i don't feel right i said take me to the house i gotta check on my kids so we did we pulled up there was sheets covering the windows and we never had curtains on our windows and i told jesse i said something's not right so i got out of the van and i went and knocked on the door dennis opened the door with a rope josephine was standing there with him i went inside josephine was in her bedroom changing brandon changing jacob i'm sorry because jacob was only six months at the time brandon was playing with his little the little army man jennifer and the baby was in the living room by the fireplace i went to josephine's bedroom to talk to dennis and josephine went with us well he goes to josephine's top right hand drawer and he pulls out a with a clip. And I said, what are you doing with that? He said, don't worry about it. I said, whatever you do, please don't our kids. Our kids are innocent. Please don't. Them. And then Josephine tugged his robe. She said, daddy, is mommy gonna do it with us? And he said, not right now, Jojo. And I said, what do you mean? What do you mean, Joe? And I said, Dennis, give me the clip or give me the please. Because he wasn't in his right mind. He was doing and when he done cocaine, I knew it because his hand would go like this. It would twitch. So he told me, Jesse, come in the house. Jesse was sitting in the living room in a rocking chair with his back towards Dennis. Dennis said, go tell Jesse to leave you for an hour, that I want to talk to you for an hour. And he said, if you tell him I got to go, I'm going to shoot him right in the back right here. So I said, okay. So I went and sat on Jesse's lap and I hugged him and I whispered to him, he's got to Jesse said, is it real or is it fake? I said, I don't know he wants you to leave me for an hour and i'm scared he said i'm not gonna leave you for an hour i said okay here's what you do you go to up the road you call my mom first and then you call the police okay well within 15 minutes he had left and when he come back the police was with him three squad cars we lived on a on the corner lot three squad cars pulled up and i'm trying to talk dennis down in the house him pointing the gun to me himself me himself i thought he was gonna me because i'm gonna save my kids in the process i'm gonna try my kids in the process if you me or not when the police got there the police kept telling me tell him to come out three of them one was sitting in front of the house and they could see dennis pointing the at me one was on the side of the house and i can't remember where the other one was but they clearly seen him doing what he was doing and they kept saying tell him to come out everything will be all right tell him to come out it'll be all right they didn't go they didn't help me get my three kids out of the house jesse grabs my daughter jennifer puts her in the van and i said i screamed grab the baby so he grabs Jacob, Jacob, six months old. He puts Jacob in the van and all the commotion. And Dennis has got Josephine and Brandon in the back, in the hallway to where he, they couldn't get to me and I couldn't get to them. Brandon went to his bedroom and he run, he run to try to get to me. And Dennis, he took his leg and he kicked him back so he couldn't get to me. And uh, when my son, Michael, he, gra he grabbed the door and he said, mom, I want my shoes. And it was cold outside. And I said, mom, get you some shoes. Don't worry about your shoes. 
So Jesse grabbed him and put him in the van. And then the police, the police told Jesse, get Jennifer away from the situation. Grab her and get her away from the situation. As Jesse puts the baby in the van, I'm getting ready to go over the threshold to try to go in there and get Josephine or Brandon. I heard the police tell him, get her away from the situation. When I stepped in, when I was getting ready to step over the threshold, Jesse grabs me and I grabbed the door and the door shut. And as soon as I shut the door and I got in the van, three pops were three pops went off. I didn't hear the pops. The next door neighbor heard them. The police had taken me down the road. They took me to the police station. They put me in the ambulance. They drove. They run red lights. They were making fun. Have you ever run red lights before in a cop car? You know, my kids are laying in my house. I told them, look, go in the house. Please go in the house because my kids are. They said, no, we have to have a warrant. Okay, well, you guys never had to have a warrant. Yeah, you guys never had to have a warrant before. If if he was smoking pot, you guys would bum rush him with no warrant. It went on for six hours. This hostage situation went on for six hours. The police officer had me sitting down the street in the cop car watching the whole situation. They said, we have to have a warrant. I said, that is my home. You do not have to have a warrant. Go in there. My kids are laying in there. I felt it in my heart. So they had to call the SWAT team. The SWAT team was there. I watched the SWAT team go up to the house, go up to the house back up and then the last time they went to, up to the house because i even told them i said i had a great big old picture window i said throw a phone in there see if you hear anything so they finally threw a phone in there and they threw it in there and they said there was nothing nothing at all i said you guys don't understand my kids are gone my kids are gone i said brandon brandon's four years old and he's not quiet he wasn't quiet he wasn't a quiet kid so they did that and still had me in the cop car and made, they it's like they was torturing me i think beach road police was afraid of dennis when the last time the swat team had walked up to the house they opened the door and they took their hat off and they put it to their heart and they backed up and uh when they backed up my heart just sank and the officer come to me and he said, your kids are and he's when they told me that he was and when they told me my kids were I had two different feelings that day. It was shattered into like he put it in a blender and fed it to me. And they told me Dennis was it's like Satan lifted off of my shoulder. I was free. I was free. And for many years after he started abusing me, I, I would wish him I told the mom I just wish he would because he's, he's abusing me so bad. Mom said, be careful what you wish for, Jennifer. Well, my wish had come true, but I didn't want my kids to be. When they told me that, I got out of the car and I fell to my knees. And they the news was there. They took a picture of me on my knees. And then I got up. I went into the tactical truck. And I yelled for my sister, Stephanie. I just wanted my sister, Stephanie. I didn't want my mom. I wanted my baby sister. So she come to me. They comforted me. And I didn't know how to tell my other kids. Because... At the time, they were eight, six, four, two, and six months old. I didn't know how to tell my kids that their sister and brother are gone because my kids were so close. You couldn't pull them apart. I mean, they were. They were just inseparable. I, I went to my mom's and it was all over the news. It was on the news and I, I couldn't handle hearing it. So I went to my mom's house and I had to tell my son that his sister and brother were gone because my two-year-old daughter wouldn't understand at the time. So I told my son, I said, Bubby, I said, your dad is gone and your sister and brother are gone and you got to help me you gotta be the man of the house now it just got worse after that my uncle tom he did all the funeral arrangements he took care of all the burial and all that so the only thing i had to do was pick out the kids casket and what they had to wear and that was the hardest because i knew that that was the last time i was ever gonna dress them ever kiss them ever love them ever sit down and have dinner with them. josephine all my kids were my heart but i had josephine for a reason i had josephine so it would take all my pain away from being abused when i was a child my sister's dad even but molested me when I was five years old. My mom would go in Chicago. My mom would go her food stamps and uh, she would leave me home and he would take me upstairs and pull his pants down and make me have oral sex with him. And he would call me Jenny. And I can't stand that word. I cannot stand Jenny. I freak out if anybody calls me that. You know, and I didn't think my mom would believe me. When I had to bury my kids, my heart was shattered. My heart was in a blender. My whole family was there for me at the funeral, at the showing, after the showing of the funeral. It's like everybody faded away from me. I was still being mentally abused by my own family because 80% of my family has told me that it was my fault my kids got even my sister that's my best friend even told me that you know what i still love her to this day it was not my fault it was not my fault but they made me believe so many years that it was my fault and if i had opened from jail that he had wrote me i would have seen something coming but i didn't open the letters i want to hear them. 
I did not want, I didn't want to see, I didn't, I, I was done. I wanted a new lifestyle. I didn't want to be abused. I didn't want to be your, because well, I you was, thought you broke free from that. I mean, he was, you know, in jail, prosecuted for his crimes, which I assume, you know, came along with a protection order, which, you know, I mean, I know it's just a piece of paper, but you would think that with somebody that violent and with that many issues being released, you would think that the police would, one, give you a heads up, and two, maybe, you know, keep an extra eye on the situation for a while, something for some sort of protection. Yeah. So I got, you know, I, I finally got away from that. And, and, you know, I feel like, I feel like I was punished because I, I, I got away from the situation and I feel like, you know, like I said, he was going to kill all of us. He was going to kill all five of us, or he was going to kill the kids and then himself and make me suffer with all of it. But he didn't get his way on that. Thank God. I'm so glad I was able to save three of my kids. So after that happened, I, I didn't know, you know, when my family started bashing me and mentally abusing me and, and, and not supporting me like I needed it. I don't, I didn't need you to, to feel how I felt. I needed you to be there for me, to talk to me, to comfort me, not to tell me it was my fault that you should have left a long time ago when he pointed the gun to your head. And he even so much as had with one of my sisters. And after he passed away, after he my kids and himself, she tried to say that I raped her when Wow. He's the one that had with her. He made me have with my sister. I could never, I could never ever think of touching somebody the wrong way because I well, was your your mom is the one that introduced y'all to begin with right yeah for an adult mother to introduce a person like that to her children that's the one that needs to be blamed the only person who is to blame is you your know mother. I, I did blame my mom for, for a long time and me and my mom me and my mom were close my mom my mom passed away in 2020 me and my mom were very very close the damage had went done and i found out and i don't care if my family don't like me over this but my mother sold me to dennis so she would not get in trouble so he would not get in trouble that's the final line did i forgive my mom yeah do i love my mom yeah she's my mom but you don't do that she undo the damage that was done nor does it excuse or make her behavior okay or acceptable my mom had five kids her fourth child she had she gave her away when she was three years old and that that done something to me i don't know what it did to me it's like she took she took a part of me away i take my sister jamie away and i didn't understand why and then my mom had another baby well the lady that my mom gave my sister to was our babysitter my mom's kids babysitter ever tell you why there's there's a few different things that was told that was told that she owed the babysitter so much money she said that she looked so much like her dad she couldn't stand it she said that she couldn't take care of her i don't know what the situation was but that broke my heart that my mom gave my little sister away and had another baby but i was young i didn't know how to process it you know so i just let it go and then finally as the years went by the babysitter let me have a relationship with my sister and then after i was i had kids and she started coming over and it was our anniversary one one year well he took my sister to victoria's secrets to buy me lingerie bra and panty sets oh well why why is my sister going and trying on something for me it's not gonna fit me i never seen any of it it all went to her that right there what are you guys doing he had me when i was 14 until 23 and then after the fact, she blasted on Facebook that I her and I lost all my friends from when I was a child because she put that on Facebook and lied. I could never, I could never hurt nobody. I was since I was five years old. And when I got away from all that, my family, you know, pretty much kind of disowned me, most of them. And so I went, I started numbing myself. I started doing pills to numb the pain and i got real bad on them and then cps stepped in and they took my other three kids they were going to adopt them and i said no let's see if my brother will take them and my brother did well my brother he would deny me visitations of my kids he tried to turn my he tried to turn my kids against me his wife even tried told me that my kids could call her mom my kids aren't calling you mom they only have one mom me you are their aunt. my brother says well what do you want my kids to call me uncle daddy or uncle john david no your kids know that you're the uncle uncle john he would deny me visit so i quit seeing my kids 
for years. Well, Michael, he's never left my side. When he, they would take him away from me, he would run back home. He would break out of the wherever and come back home to me. My kids running back home to me, nothing wrong. My home was clean, food. My kids had a roof over their house, over their head. Well, the DCS worker told me, go ahead and keep the social security money that you're getting for the kids. So they'll have a roof over their head when they come home. And then she told me, you have, you, if you get three consecutive clean drug screens, I will give you your kids back. I had two drug screens. Then I went to the IOP class to do my other drug screen because I knew I was clean. Girl in class had told the counselor that I had offered her my pills. Well, I had notes from this. I never answered this girl. I had notes from this girl asking me if she would sell me some, if I would sell her some, and I never responded. Well, when I went to go to that class that day, my counselor come out. She said, well, you're disqualified. You can't do the class. I'm like, oh my God, are you serious? So that knocked me out of getting my kids back. So um, they just took this girl's word for it? They took this girl's word for it. And they and she got her kids back. Oh, uh, how convenient. Well, I, I seen her. I seen her and I told her, she wrote her, I'm going to get you for something. And I said, you better roll that window down because you're going to get me more for that, more than that. So probably a year went by. I cleaned myself up. And I, I went to social service. I paid to have the drug screen. I paid to have the assessment. They come back to me and said, I, we can't help you a year after. I said, what do you mean you can't help me? We can't help you. You can't help somebody that wants their children back? So I just left it at that. I said, well, when they turn 18, the two kids will come to me. And they did. But, you know, I broke my daughter's heart so much over the past years. It's like she doesn't trust me. I've, I've been clean for quite a while. I quit smoking pot. I don't do pills anymore. I have a new grandbaby that I have purpose for. I have grandsons. Three, actually, the two, they're not biological, but they are still my grandbabies. My son just had a baby. He'll be five months tomorrow, and we've only got to see him a couple times. But when I held him, I said I got purpose. I got more purpose in my life. And then seven days before my, my sister had a set of twins, and when Josephine and Brandon were my sister told me, God took your two angels and give me two angels. That devastated me. Wow. Who says something like that? That devastated me. Well, now I'm really close to one of her twins. And she just had a baby two months ago. And she always told me, always asked me. She said, Aunt Jennifer, if I have a little girl, can I name her after Josephine? And I said, yes. Yes, sweetheart, you can. And she's asked me this forever. She had a little girl. She named her Josephine Lynn. And when I hold her in my arms, it's like, it's just... She picks my heart up and puts it back together. And I've never, I haven't said Josephine so many times since my Josephine has been gone. But when I hold little baby Josephine, it's like my heart is been back together. My niece, she said, I had her for me, Aunt Jennifer, but I also had her for you because I know that you need that love back. And then, oh, bittersweet and then, moment. And then I called all kinds of ruckus from family members saying I didn't have the right to let my baby name her baby after Josephine. It wasn't right. And and I know I hurt my daughter's feelings because at one time she said that she didn't want to use that name. So I was like, you know, okay, you're not going to use your sister's name. Then I'm going to let Stephanie, my niece, use it. And 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 I know it. I know that hurt her feelings. Every time I say something about Jos, it's like it bothers her. And I want nothing more because she's my only daughter left. I want nothing more to have, have the greatest relationship with her. But I feel like Dennis, sometimes I feel like He's winning because he's, he told me that I would never be happy with another man. He took, you know, and I, I think the reason he took Josephine and Brandon is because he knows that I wanted Josephine, that Brandon wasn't his. And he knew how I felt about his, his, his nephew. I couldn't help it. He was too good to me. He was better to me than his own uncle was. And then, you know, Brandon's dad got killed in an electric accident in 97. Brandon was only a year old and it broke my heart. I wanted Brandon and Robbie to be together, but I didn't want them to be together like this. And to this day, I still get mentally abused. My sister, she's mad at me because my, my niece wants to move in with me because she's tired of being down there. And she just mentally abused me this morning and, and broke my heart. You know, I couldn't even take a shower. I, I It took me like 15 minutes to take a shower. I, I fell in the shower because my legs give out on me. When I get stressed out, I you know, I hurt real bad and I, I can't do nothing. And, and she really stressed me out. You know, I told her, I said, I know you hate me. You don't have no love for me anymore. You know, and she's my best friend. My mom had her. So I would have somebody to love all my life, you know. But the drugs, the drugs are evil. I got the autopsy reports back. Dennis had 50 milligrams of cocaine in his system. 50 milligrams. Oh. 50. And in my heart, in my heart, I know that if he wasn't on drugs, he wouldn't have the kids. People say, how could you feel that way? 
because I slept with him. I had three children with him. We would take the kids camping. We would take the kids hiking. If one of the kids were born, they were two weeks old. We'd go camping. Even, you know, bottle, nursing, whatever. The kids always went camping. We would go boat. We would go tubing. I mean, we did it all. He was he was good in public, but behind closed doors after I had my first son. And then when Brandon's daddy died, it really got bad. I don't remember getting pregnant with my last two children because he drugged me up and I got pregnant. Jacob has a different dad. Brandon has a different dad. And I know who their dads are. But you don't drug somebody up to get your way. And then after I lost my kids, I was by this black man. He took me into a hotel. He made me smoke with him. He had a revolver. He beat me so bad. He bout me. My whole right side was black and blue. Then finally, 12, I did this for 12, I suffered with this for 12 hours. And every time I would try to get up, he would hit me again in the gun. I thought he was going to kill me. And then finally, he let me go, dropped me off behind my house. And I walked home. And as soon as I walked in the door, I just fell to the floor. I went to the emergency room. They did a kit. They showed me pictures, showed me a lineup. I showed who he was. And that's the last I heard of it. He me so so bad today i have problems using the bathroom number two my muscles are so weak that i can't use the bathroom for maybe a week or two weeks at a time man so was he prosecuted then i don't know i i didn't hear anything i let it go i tried i put it in the back of my mind it was done and over with you know so you just you don't do people like that and it is not okay for a 14 year old or 15 to think it's okay to be with a, a grown adult it is not okay not okay it, it amazes me how many how many parents are involved with the trafficking issues in the united states it's really terrifying the amount of parents well, will sell their children for financial gain well the lady the lady that sold me for the money I'm married to her. Well, I was, I'm not married now, but I was with her nephew and she literally told him some stuff that she did to me. And I told him all these years, we've been together 10, 20 years. And I told him what had happened and he didn't believe me. He, you know, he didn't want to believe me. Well, one day he was up there and she told him that he, and then she said, I didn't do that. And then I got down on my knees in front of her one day. And I said, Hey, I need you to ask me for forgiveness. She said, what for? I said, for the stuff that you did to my mom's daughter, me, me, I watched this woman shoot up in her arms, in her feet, in her neck, all this. Three months ago, I was wiping this lady's butt because she's sick. Well, you are a much stronger person than most. I still care for somebody who puts you through tragic events like that, that no person should ever have to experience, much less a child. I showed somebody a picture of me when I was 15 pregnant and it made him sick. I said, I don't want to see that. You, you was a baby. I had five kids by the time I was 23. I lost three kids when I was 23. You should have never been in that situation to begin with. It is most certainly not your doing or your fault in any way, shape or form. And for anybody in your family to try to pass that blame to you is just ridiculous. And I think it's important that you hear that toxic is toxic, whether they're Very family important. or somebody that you don't know, it's okay to cut toxic people from your life. Yep. And I don't want them toxic people in my life. I don't need it. I don't want it. I want to be me. I want to be, sometimes I want to be by myself. I don't, relationship, no, because I'm scared. My, my last relationship, the man was really, really good to me. And things just went south because my mindset was like, you know, back then. But now, now that I'm, now that I'm, my mind's clear. I don't smoke pot. I don't do pills. My mind's clear. So I can be me. I can be Jennifer Lynn for a change after 23 years of my heart crying for my kids. Me thinking it was my fault. I didn't pull that trigger. He did. When I got the autopsy reports, he molested my daughter. He molested his own daughter. And, you know, and I, I don't trust women. I, I would rather be friends with a male. And people's like, well, you're just a that's why you want to talk to males. No, I don't get dogged. I don't get told it's your fault. I don't get, you know, even though males have done me how they've done me, 
And I used to be scared to death of black people. But you know what? Only one black man did that to me. Not all of them. So I can't be scared of other people because of what I have been gone through. I want to build a, a better relationship with my children. I want I build a better relationship with God and myself. I want to have the best relationship with my grandkids. My five-year-old, he, I love him so much. He has, he has helped me more than anybody has ever helped me any, ever. And I'm his pretty mammal. <laughs> I'm his pretty mammal. His mom accepts me more than my own family does. I feel like she loves me more than my own family does. Yeah, you know, family does not have to be blood. That's for certain. And no. you deserve to surround yourself with people who genuinely care about you and would never place blame upon you that does not belong on you. And then, you know, my sister, she tried to tell me that she got on dope because Josephine and Brandon got killed. No, don't blame it on them. Do not blame it on them. And, you know, it, 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 it happened right before Christmas. I had already had my kids' as Christmas bought and picked up. And at the funeral, Josephine, she wanted a great big old makeup kit. So I bought it. I went and got it. And she was laying in the casket. He shot him in the head. He was laying, They were laying in the casket. And I tried to put the makeup on her. But it would just smear. And what bothers me is a person, when I was younger, he was in love with me. And... When I was standing in the casket, he come up to me and his mom come up to me and said, well, you know, he was at the house the night before and he seen Dennis beat Brandon. I said, well, why didn't you call the police? You witnessed Dennis pick Brandon up and throw him against the, the wall. And then Brandon gets, he's hurt. So he stops into the bedroom. Dennis follows him and then beats his ass. My four-year-old. My four uh, yeah, anybody or report it to no, the police? Didn't, no, didn't say nothing to nobody until I was standing at my kids' casket. Oh my God. And told me that. Why didn't you call the police? Well, I was over there looking for you. Okay, well, you was looking for me, but you witnessed this. Why didn't you call the police? Right. Then I asked my mom. My mom... All these years before my mom passed away, my mom blamed herself. She said, it's my fault, Jennifer. It's my fault. I will die believing that this is my fault. And I said, mom, it's not your fault. I forgive you for everything that's happened. I love you. You're my world. I don't care. I don't care if you sold me to Dennis. You're still my mom. I don't care if you give my, my sister away. You're still my mom. I mean, I care, but it's to the point to where, you know what, there ain't nothing I can do about it. It's, it's done and over with, but a I strong asked, person I, to forgive and move forward from something I, like that. So major props to you, girl. The reason my mom blames herself, blamed herself is because the wind that Wednesday before it happened, I called my mom and I said, mom, will you please go get my kids? Please go get them. She said, no, I'm not. And then the next morning they got at like 10, th at 10 30. But really, they laid there for six hours dead before the police even went in there. And I told them, go in there. They didn't go in there. That's just a, a complete, total failure on so many adults' part from the word go till even today. Yeah. I mean, that's just horrific. I can't even begin to imagine. And, you know, I mean, with, with my experience, I... I remember the day that my ex came home with a gun. He had gotten his carry conceal permit and bought a, a and I sat in that bathroom and I cried for an hour, just terrified, knowing it was just a matter of time before you know, we were all. And thankfully we, you know, got, got away and, and got safe. And but man, I can't even, even just, Thinking about it and being fearful for it was, you know, would be enough to send me into a panic attack. So I can't even begin to imagine your pain and your suffering. And I am so, so sorry for the heartbreak and experience that you've had to work through and deal with. Everybody says, you need to go to counseling. You know, you need to go to counseling. You know what? I have went to counseling. I don't need a counselor to tell me how I feel because I know how I feel. Well, different people work involved. through different things in different ways. And, and, you know, as society, it's really important that we try to be understanding and, and respectful of the way that people choose to get through their 
their grief. I mean, that's a serious thing to have to try to get through. And there's no particular way that anybody should or shouldn't grieve. The grieving process is your own. Yeah. And everybody grieves different. You know, everybody, everybody grieves different. And yeah, I, I was in the wrong because I turned to Xanaxis. But you know what? I didn't have nobody to help me support me. You know, and I, I can't think of a whole lot of people that wouldn't have that problem after suffering through such a tragedy like that. I've tried to kill myself. I've been on life support for 20, 24 hours, you know, and that's not the way to go. That is not the way to go. No, no matter, no matter how bad somebody hurts you, you don't do self harm. And I have. And I, I, I feel bad for it because my kids, they've seen me on life support. I don't ever want to see my, I don't ever want my kids to see that again. And, you know, I, I know Josephine and Brandon are safe. I don't worry about them. I wonder. I don't worry. I wonder. But I worry about my other three kids all the time. All the time. My youngest baby moved to California. I worry about them all the time. If you're being abused, don't be afraid to break the cycle and get away from it. Absolutely. Because if you don't. Because if you don't get away from it, you never know what's going to happen. For so many years, it's been so hidden and swept under the rug and, you know, like the forbidden issue that nobody should talk about. Well, it's killing people. It's killing a lot yeah. of people. And the vast majority of times, it's women and children. And until we can wake up as you know, society and come together and acknowledge this problem for what it is, it's not going to change. And this is something where it's getting to the point where, I mean, this is a serious problem that's happening on a mass scale every day. And we have to stand up and do something. Enough is enough. It, it has to, it, it's got to stop. It's got to stop because it's not, it's not fair to our children. It's not fair to our world. You see more men taking out their family than you do women. Absolutely. It's just to get back to her. Right. And it's I know he's done power that. and control. And it's not just men. It does happen with yeah. women, but it's it is far less likely. And the I mean the statistics are what they are. And while I mean there are men who are abused, and I think there yeah. are a lot more men that are abused than what the statistics have any clue of. However, statistics when it comes to deaths you can't fabricate those so easily and it is what it is yeah uh, an investigation you know most times shows what happens and the likelihood of, of a woman a man from a domestic violence altercation is far more rare well me and my mom me and my mom had plotted to try to take him out but we didn't follow through with it, but you well, know, I mean, I, when, when it comes to self-defense, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and it's, it is, it is not okay to take a child and sell them. It is not okay. It is not okay. Absolutely. It's not, it is not okay. It, it makes me sick. It makes me sick. And the rates at which this is occurring in the United States is just absolutely astounding and disgusting. And it's imperative that we wake up to what's happening and save these innocent children. I, I even tried to file charges on the person when I was younger. And they told me, well, if you were 30 years old, you could press charges, but you can't now because you're older. And I'm like, really? And you know, yeah. Yeah, after after they did that to me, I thought it was okay. So I would go say, hey, I need to make some money because I don't have none. Call the person. Why? Because groomed me that way. You thought it was okay. My mom didn't buy my school clothes. They did. They were my mom's friends. And I found out that they done stuff to my mom that my mom never leaked out to me. Oh, I, I don't no. doubt for one second that she started as a victim. But once you go the other way and start victimizing others for your own profit, that you don't get to call yourself just a victim anymore. I mean, were you victimized? Yeah, but you have the power and the control and the ability to, to make it. different choices. Yeah, and to stop it. Yeah.
I remember one time my sister's, I was over at my sister's house and her dad was there and he tried to give my kids money. I said, no, you don't. No, you don't. I will give my kids money. Get away from my kids. You made me give you oral when I was five years old. No, negative. We'll never well, be you, around. My you learned that lesson the hard way. It's, it's just crazy. On Facebook, I have a group that's called Unspoken Words by Jennifer Lynn for grieving parents that have lost children. I've been in the process of writing a book. And you know, honestly, I have let all this in God's hand. And I keep telling myself, when my book is ready to be published, God will send me that person. And when I'm ready to share my story like I am now, God will bring that person to me. And guess what? God brought you to me for a reason. Oh. And I told my daughter, I said, Jennifer, I said, I'm doing a podcast. And she said, I, that'll be good for you. So that's why we do what we do. You know, there are so many stories out there and these, you know, survivors have, you know, they're so limited with how they can get their story out there and we deserve to be heard. We, yes, absolutely. And I feel like I haven't been heard. I think I've, I feel like I've just been shamed, you know, and, and a lot of women feel that way. And unfortunately, all too often, that's exactly what happens. And, and we feel that, that shame from, I mean, it just bombards you from every aspect and not in every situation, but you have, you know, friends, family, the community, law enforcement, the court systems, you know, I mean, it's, it comes from all angles and when you are made to feel like you're wrong or you have something that you should be ashamed of people can't even begin to imagine what that does to somebody and how harsh that can affect the healing process i don't trust the courts i don't trust the law and and you know i have a lot of triggers and when my when my five-year-old grandson's here he likes his you know, the Nerf guns and he likes that. They'll be clicking, click, 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 click. Mm. And it drives me nuts. It drives me yeah. nuts. And I've, and, and I've explained it to him because he's so smart. I've explained it to him. I said, Bubby, and I take him to the, I take, he, he goes out to the graveyard with me all the time and we talk about him. And one day he, we was at the graveyard and there was a rock on Josephine's side and he picked it up and he said, Mamaw, Josephine and Brandon are hiding from their dad. Yeah. Wow. You know, because I've told I've told him what what happened, you know, and why I don't like the clicking. Yeah, but he's my heart. My grandbabies are my heart, and absolutely, yeah. baby Josephine, she just melts in my heart, and my niece knows that. Well, I'm I'm grateful that you have your niece, and and that you two seem to have a close relationship, and I hope she moves in with you. You know, maybe it'll maybe it'll be good for both of you to. I do too. Be real and if she's unhappy and uncomfortable with her current situation then i mean she's she's got a little one she's got to think of get out and uh, <laughs> where, where you're comfortable yeah. you know and i don't want her mom hating me and mad at me but i feel like she hates In my me. opinion she screw her no. <laughs> That's but, you know i mean i just want i've been through hell and back and i know how it feels the drugs is not an answer not an answer give it to god because God, God has got me through for 23 years, pulled me through being on life support and it's not okay. And when, when women are abused and they get out of the situation and they, they find, if they find a man that is really, really good to them, they don't know how to accept that because they've been abused so long and they're, they're thinking in their mind, well, I've been abused. So let's act out and abuse this person you don't know what a healthy relationship is no. much less you know how to things in a positive continuously yeah. moving forward environment i mean it takes a lot of work for for a relationship and if you're damaged then you got to work on yourself you got to heal and you got to recognize what's healthy and recognize the red flags and It'll help the healing process so you heal, heal the proper way. I've always wanted to get my story out. I've always, I've wanted to go to, to middle schools and high schools and tell them my situation. And you know, if you, if you feel, don't run to somebody that's older because I did. I didn't have a dad in my life. And I was thinking, hey, you know what? I can get away from my mom. I can do whatever I want to do. This man's going to love me. He's going to give me children and he's just going to worship me. No, 
he broke me. Well, you thought that because they broke you at a young age. A 14 year old does not have the mental or emotional ability to be able to react and think things through. That was the adult's responsibility. Yep. So, I mean, it is what it is, but I, I'm a survivor. I'm not a victim anymore. I'm a survivor. And, you know, it's one day at a time. I hope to get my book out there. I really do. You because well, when you get your book written and, and published, you have to let me know and we'll do some podcasts to promote it. Well, hey, if you hear anybody that's publishing, let me know. I, I, mean, I already I do have a couple of people that I that I am familiar with. So I'll I'll send you some information and details. I have 200 pages plus. A couple years ago, I had a mental breakdown and I put myself in Hendricks County Behavior Health because I just needed it. I didn't want to do nothing stupid. I needed that help. One of the staff come up to me and said, hey, I'm going to pick a couple people to write their story. Well, he picked me. So I started writing it down and believe it or not, my story is still up there at Hendricks County Behavioral so people can read it. Nice. See your so inspiration. Yeah, I want to, I was even on the Montel Williams show over it. I want to get my book out because when I read it, I set it down for probably a month or two. And then I went back and I reread the whole thing. When I read it, it shook me like it was somebody else's story, not mine, somebody else's. Yeah. And I'm like, I have to get this out. I have to. They have, they're going to have to edit it. They're going to, they'll have to put all the punctuations in it. Cause I didn't graduate. I, I got cut out of school in eighth grade because of him. I had to have, I had all my kids. I had to raise my kids and not sitting in class, raising my hand and asking him if I could go pee when I had kids to ask me if they can do this or do that. <laughs> Negative. Uh, please do. Cause I'm really all come together for you. I'd, yeah. I'd, uh, I'd love to see you be able to get your story out there on a mass level like that it will in in god's time because like i said yeah. god god brought you to me for a reason he's pretty magical at opening all the right doors at all the right times isn't he though yeah he really is you may not see him but he's there who was it somebody yeah. asked me the other day well i i pray all the time i pray all the time well keep praying because you know what he can't answer your prayer right now because he's got the whole world but he does. You know, know and I think a lot of people don't take into consideration that he knows what's going to happen long term down the road. Maybe if he were to answer that prayer, it's going to screw something up that would have been a thousand times better for you long run. Do you believe in numbers? I have a lot of crazy things yeah. come up with repetitive numbers and such. I was 23 when the, I had my when I had five kids, when I had my youngest. I was 23 when my two kids got my first grandson was born on 10 23 23 my aunt's birthday is the, and there's a lot of other 23s that pop up and that's an angel number nice well, i was like don't oh, find a way to use your tragedy for good yeah but you know i'm i work through it i i, I write a lot i write my feelings down a lot i have a whole box a whole box of tablets that have all my feelings in it for my kids I don't talk to everybody about it. I write about it. Absolutely. It's, it's so, easier sometimes and, and more effective to make sure you get everything out. Well, because you know what? I feel like when I'm writing that, that tablet and that pen, it's not going to tell me how I feel. Not going to tell me how I should feel or what I should do. Amen. But I really do want to get out in schools and, you know, like that and just tell my story and because it's not okay you people young kids they think it's okay but it's not gotta sh share that awareness you know for right now that's about all we can do yes so we can bring people together to create change yes and i've always wanted to do something like this i just didn't know how about about how going to do it well i'm you know. grateful that that uh god had our paths crossed so that way we yeah. can work together and my daughter said how did you find them? I said, well, I was on a group and I commented and she found me. So for sure. Yeah. We're, we're doing what we can to try to yeah. you know, spread the word and bring awareness. And you know, it's, we, the people have to rally. We have yeah. to rally and come together and force change. I mean, it's, that's all there is to it. 
This is yeah. our country. And yes. It, it's time that we start behaving like it. And yes. So hopefully one step at a time, God's bringing us all together. So oh, yes. we're coming. <laughs> yeah. He's got his warriors and we're coming. Let's smash that devil. So before we go, I, I love that picture right uh, behind you of your kids. Would you like to, to share that? Yeah. That's my favorite picture. It I is a like, really great picture. One of my friends, I said, I put on Facebook, I said, I want a canvas of that. And one of my friends, she went to Walmart and got a canvas of it. And I, I love it. It's my favorite picture because Josephine's holding, Josephine's holding Brandon. Yeah, it is. So it. It's my favorite picture. I even had, I even had their portraits tattooed on each leg and oh, nice. they, they walk, they take every step that their mom takes. They take every step with me. Wow. That's now that, that's powerful meaning for some, for some artwork. So that put that in the end that, you know, that, you know, they're on me and they walk with me every step of the day, you know, and I just, I, I know, I know I'm going to go to heaven with my kids. I know I got, and you know what? Our children our when I was younger, I, I didn't believe this. I was stubborn and I've been grown. I was grown up in a Baptist church and all my life with my grandparents. And now I, I tell myself that, you know, my kids aren't my kids. God just owned them to me. For a short time mm -hmm. yeah they are our yeah. gifts yes so and the grandchildren why couldn't we have had grandkids first here i'll show you a picture of my uh, my emmett oh so precious so teeny he had to have cranial surgery last month so he gonna be okay oh yeah he's good yeah he just got to wear a helmet for a year it's just he was born two months early and his soft spot uh, yeah so he's gonna do he's gonna be real good but when i held him when i held him for the first time because i seen him when he was like four days old and his little head fit in my hand i got i got a i probably got 500 pictures of that baby <laughs> so precious but when i held him in my arms for the first time i just my heart just melted and i tears fell and my, tears fell and i i come home and i just jumping for joy i said i have more purpose now <laughs> yes yes absolutely he's god sure person. knows what he's doing with his timing yes he does so yeah so it was such an honor to talk to you and to hear your heartbreaking story and you know all the tragedy and heartbreak it's you know there's there's light at the end of that tunnel and there there is definitely well, not there's not darkness use that for good yeah, there's no darkness at that tunnel for me, and I don't give up. I I I I don't give up. I've tried to give up, but you know what? God don't want me to give up. I have purpose. I haven't found my purpose yet, but I think it's my grandkids. I do believe, and 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 baby Joseph. Yeah, I struggled with that for a long time, knowing that I needed to do something, and I was getting so frustrated for a while there. Cause I'm like, all right, God. Come on, let's go. Like, we don't have time to waste. We don't have time to burn. What do you want me to do? I'm here. I'm here to serve you, to do your will. But I need some guidance here, you know? And, <laughs> yeah. and for, for a long time, the only thing I kept hearing is just be still. Just yeah. Be still. And when you're ready, you're ready to accomplish. But I reluctantly listened after a while. Yeah. The way that things have, wow, this is just really spectacular. Look at all of the amazing things he's doing to create good out of such horrifying tragedies. And he still finds a way to take that, to create something brighter well you know i i'm more than happy to do podcast anytime you want to do it i'd love to have you on again anytime just let me know well like i Whenever said you're ready, I'm, I'm here there's a lot more that i could talk about well, i could I'm talk your ear. i could talk your ear off girl so but well, yeah i'm here and and would love to listen and would love to hear your stories so anytime you have some you know free time that you want to hop on and you know, talk more I'm, about it than just give me a heads I'm free, up. I'm free all the time. I, I, I can't work. I have fibromyalgia and I just, I, I, I can't work. So I'm at home all the time. So I'm free anytime. <laughs> Day right, get something scheduled then. Okay. 
everything will be all right. One step at a time. You got this. You're right. I do. I've had it for 23 we're, we're years. We're stronger together. You're not alone. And we're stronger together. No. And you know what? I thought I was alone for many, many years. That's another reason why I made my my group. I'll send you the, the thing of it. That's yes. why I made it. Because I wanted other parents to know that they're not alone. And we're not, yes. you and know? I'll include a link for all of our viewers. I'll include a link in the description below so that you can check out her, her group and send Sweet. a request to join. Sweet. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to another one. And I'll, yes, do it I I and I'll do it until the day, until my last breath. Okay. Perfect. Sounds good. <laughs> All okay. right. You have a good day, Daniel. Have a blessed day. All right. And I don't say bye. I say, see you later. Cause bye is forever. Amen. We'll see you later. <laughs> All right. Hus. See ya. See ya.